Okay, welcome to chapter four. We're going to look at what happens to particles when they are placed in solution. Uh, so solution chemistry. Now we're still kind of building tools in our toolbox. Um, draw a particle to show sodium chloride dissolving in water. So sodium chloride, NaCl, it's going to separate into a sodium ion and a chlorine ion. They are no longer connected or touching. They are two separate things. Um, which they always were anyway, because they one stole an electron from the other, but they used to be touching if they're in a solid state. But when they're in the water state, we have to look at their charges to see how the water surrounds it. Um, sodium ion is positive. So the electronegative end of the, oc the, the water, the oxygen end, is going to surround and pull apart the sodium. Um, so it's important to get the proper orientation for how this happens. Um, in order to dissolve the solid, the water molecules will surround each individual particle and rip them apart. Um, so for the chlorine, the hydrogens are the positive side of the chlorine. We need to orient the hydrogens, and this would be 360 degrees all the way around, um, three-dimensionally as well. But the, all the hydrogens are going to be attracted since they are positive partially positive, they'll surround the negative ions and the oxygens on the water will surround the positive ions. Um, the same thing would happen for calcium chloride. For calcium chloride though, we just need to note that the charges are different. Um, calcium is 2 plus and then there would be two chlorines for every one calcium and that's going to be a tricky idea later. But the same thing, the oxygens are negative, they would surround the positive ions, the hydrogens are positive and would surround the negative ions. Okay, um, so determining which ones are even going to mix and what type of chemistry is going to happen depends on the substance. Uh, we get the like dissolves like rule, and we want to predict if these are going to mix. Um, sodium nitrate and water. Well, water is polar. That is our definition. And sodium nitrate is ionic. So ionic things have charges. Polar things have partial charges. Those will mix. So that is a yes. They will mix. Um, C6H14, uh, hydrocarbons. This is, our, this is a newer thing, but things that have carbon and hydrogen only, they're going to be nonpolar. Those will not mix since water is nonpolar. Um, iodine, we'll get into more of how you identify polarity later. Iodine, I2, is a totally symmetrical molecule. Um, polarity has to do with shape. Um, so if we have an iodine connected to another iodine, it's totally symmetrical. That's, that's what actually makes it nonpolar. So I have two nonpolar things. They will mix together if they're both nonpolar. It will be very weak, but they will mix together. And then we apply that down here again. Iodine is nonpolar, water is polar, those will not mix. So we'll get practice with that. You have to identify, the big one is hydrocarbons are nonpolar, ionic things will dissolve in water for the most part. Um, and dissociation, this is an idea that gets um, challenging uh, once we actually start adding some math to it later on. So calcium chloride, when it breaks apart, in its solid form, those are all connected in a crystal lattice. In its aqueous form, which is when it's dissolved in water, the calcium ion, like we said, it separates the water, pulls it apart, and it pulls the two chlorines apart. I have three individual things now. And we say those are AQ, aqueous. Okay, and we'll say that for all of them. Um, just like on our slide a couple of slides ago, um, we would have the calcium totally separate from the two chlorines. And the two chlorines are separate from each other as well. They're three different things. So now I went from having one thing to having three things. That's an important idea in chemistry. When they dissolve, you can get more of each substance. Or more, uh, I'm sorry, more individual substances than you started with. Because before they were connected into molecules, and then after they're all spread out. So here, when I do the iron nitrate, we get the iron. This is an iron 3 plus. 
aqueous, but now we have three nitrates. The nitrates will stay together, each individual nitrate. They will not break up into nitrogens and oxygens. The nitrate is polyatomic, the whole ion stays together. Um, really, that's because the ion itself is covalently bonded to itself. Uh, but it's an ionic bond between the iron and the nitrate. KBr, we get one potassium, and we get one bromine. Those are both aqueous. And ammonium dichromate, we get two ammoniums, NH4 pluses, plus one dichromate, Cr2O4O7, I'm sorry, two minus. And those are aqueous as well. Um, so here we need to identify each of these as strong, weak, or non-electrolytes. Some of this is going to be just, you have to get the new definitions down, for especially for strong and weak. Non and strong are easy, but that weak one is kind of challenging to identify. So we go through HClO4. HClO4 is a strong acid. We had to memorize that. So this is strong. C6H12 is a hydrocarbon, non-polar non-electrolyte. You have to have charges and polarity to conduct electricity. Lithium hydroxide is ionic and it is a strong base. So that is our new category there, strong. Silver chloride, very tricky. It's ionic, but it's not very soluble. It's an insoluble solid. We will do more with that later, but we have these solubility rules. Um, this is going to be weak because it only partially dissolves. Solubility gets tough. There are extra definitions you have to learn there. It's not just ionic. It's not very soluble. NH3, another definition. This is our weak base. This is the only definition we have for a weak base right now. So it is a weak electrolyte. Calcium chloride is going to be a strong, ionic, soluble compound. HC2H3O2, having that hydrogen out front here and here. This is how we identify acids. Um, they're not our strong acids, so both of these are going to be weak. Molarity calculations then should be really simple definitional things. You just have to remember the f there's an equation. Uh, molarity, big M, is moles over liters. Uh, sometimes you can use that just algebraically. Um, oftentimes we're going to find ourselves using it with dimensional analysis, so it's important to understand how that, that per sign, moles per liter, can be used as a conversion factor as well if you have a molarity. And I'll show you some examples of that along the way. Um, so we always convert to moles. That means we've got molar masses, grams to deal with, liters and milliliters. Let's, uh, let's take a look at these problems. Uh, calculate the molarity of a solution prepared by dissolving 11.85 grams of potassium permanganate in enough water to make 750 milliliters of solution. So grams, we always think we need to get to moles. Um, when in doubt, convert to moles. We get a molar mass of 158.04 grams per mole. Um, and that's going to give me 0 0.0750 moles. Now at that point, we have the volume too, 750 milliliters is 0.75 liters. So we get a 0.1 sig figs, I need three sig figs, molar solution of KMNO4. Calculate the mass, so now we need the grams needed to prepare 175 milliliters of a 0.5 molar solution. So this is an example where we have the molarity and we can use that as a conversion. If we start out with our 175 milliliters, now I think we know how these work now. You can go ahead and convert that to liters without showing your work um, obsessively with everything, but everything else you need to show here. 0.175 liters, and every one liter of solution has 0 0.500 moles sodium chloride. Okay. That's how we use that molarity as a conversion. Once we're in moles, we just need grams. We know that every mole of NaCl is 58.44 grams NaCl. 
Um, so that one, we don't even need the, the equation necessarily. That's just a conversion problem to give us 5.11 grams of sodium chloride. How many milliliters? We can use that to count volumes as well. And again, we have the molarity here, so we can use that as a conversion. This is just going backwards. 31.52 grams of solid NaOH. Grams go to moles, so 40 grams per mole, molar mass. And then molarity, this says we have 2.48 moles of NaOH in every one liter of solution. So how many liters of solution do we need? Um, we calculate that out, and we get 0 0.318 liters. This question is asking for milliliters, so 318 milliliters. Watch out for your sig figs. And here's where it gets challenging. Uh, once we add math, we remember that these things dissociate into ions. So I really don't have calcium hypochlorite. I have calcium ions, and then I have two hypochlorite ions. So calculate the molarity of each thing in solution. Well, if my calcium hypochlorite is 0.25, I only have one calcium there that will also be 0.25 molar. But I have two hypochlorites for every one calcium. So this is actually going to be 0.5 molar hypochlorite. It actually doubled. So my concentration of individual ions can be bigger than the initial molecule because there are two of those in every one molecule. Um, Chromium 3 chloride is going to be the same thing. I have one chlorine, chromium in there, 3 plus, but we do have three individual chlorines. My chlorine concentration is three times bigger. So if I have a problem that says I have two molar chromium 3 chloride, I really have two molars of chromium and six molar chlorine. There actually isn't any chromium-3 chloride in there because it's soluble. We don't have that in the solution. We have dissociated chromium and chloride ions, and their concentrations are in a 3 to 1 ratio because their formula is in a 3 to 1 ratio, and they broke apart. Um, same thing with the first one. We don't actually have calcium hypochlorite. We have calcium and we have hypochlorite, but they are separate dissociated things. Uh, it gets really challenging when we start putting those in other types of problems. So now it says determine the molarity of the chloride ion in a solution. So you see these numbers and you just kind of, you start working. We've got 9.82 grams of copper chloride. Grams go to moles. So the molar mass of copper chloride is 134.45 grams for every one mole of copper 2 chloride. Um, that's going to give us 0 0.0730 moles. And we have a solution volume of 600 milliliters, so 0 0.6 liters. That's going to give me 0 0.122 molar copper 2 chloride. That's not what the question is asking for. The question is asking for the molarity of chloride. Well, there are two chlorines here. When this dissociates, my chlorine is going to be double that amount. There are two chlorines. That's harder to see. If you don't read the problems, you're going to miss those. Uh, here's another one. Calculate the molarity of iron 3 and sulfate ions by preparing this solution. So we have 48.05 grams iron 2 sulfate. Grams go to moles. Uh, molar mass pretty big here, 399.91 
grams for every mole is going to give me 0 0.120 moles. Uh, volume here, 800 milliliters, 0.8 liters. That's going to give me a molarity of 0 0.150 molar of the iron 3 sulfate. But that's not what the question is asking. We're asking for the iron 3 and then separately the sulfate. Well, there are two iron 3s, so my solution here is going to be double. 0.3 molar iron 3 ions. And there are three sulfates, so it's going to be three times bigger, 0 0.450 molar sulfate ions. Okay, um, now so not only do we want to be able to calculate that mathematically, this would always also be something where you'd want to be able to draw. Um, if you had to draw this in solution, you would want to draw them, uh, the iron 3 ions and the sulfate ions in the correct ratio. So for every two of these you're going to draw, you're going to want to draw three of the sulfates because they exist in a 2 to 3 ratio. So we want to be able to, to visualize these as well. Um, and then the last thing we're going to do with molarity is dilutions. So what volume of 12 molar hydrochloric acid must be used to prepare 600 milliliters of a 0.3 molar hydrochloric acid solution? Um, this isn't something where you're dissolving a solid into a liquid to get it aqueous. This is where you have a concentrated solution and you're trying to add water to make it less concentrated. Um, so the equation we use for that is M1V1. What is my initial molarity and volume? And what do I want my final molarity and volume to be? Molarity and volume uh, multiply together to give us moles. So as long as your moles don't change, you can add as much water as you want. That's how that equation gets justified. So what volume, if I have a 12 molar solution, what volume do I need in order to make a final molarity of 0.3 molar HCl, and we need 600 milliliters of it. Um, you can keep this in milliliters as long as you get, you'll get the volumes on both sides, the milliliters won't cancel out. You can look at this and you'll see that the molarity is gone. Once you divide that, you'll be left with milliliters. So your volume for this one is 15 milliliters. So we read that as, I need 15 milliliters of my concentrated substance, and then I'm going to add water until I get to the 600 milliliter mark, and that will give me a new 0.3 molar solution, which is much, much more diluted than the 12 molar. Uh, here's another one for sodium hydroxide. Um, if I have a 9 molar solution, what volume do I need to make... 1.2 liters of a 1 molar solution. Uh, molarities cancel out. This one's going to be in liters once we finish, and it's going to give us 0 0.133 liters, or 133 milliliters. I need 133 milliliters of my concentrated substance, add enough water to get to the 1.2 liter mark, and then my new molarity will be 1 molar if I follow those steps. That's how we read that setup. Okay, good luck with Chapter 4.